welcome back to Degraded Daughters of Dianetics. We're back to chat about some uh, really cool stuff that Vanessa and I have been talking about for about five, six months now since we reconnected. Um, this is another thing that we've kind of bonded over and she's been really amazing because she's been able to give me some really good examples of some stuff that helped me to really unpack some stuff that I didn't realize was so much deeper than what I had thought and felt. Um, and with that, I think it's uh, pretty fun and we wanted to share it and we hope that this helps and we hope that this can help so many people in so many different situations. Um, this has already helped for me to be talking with other people in different situations and I'm sure Vanessa as well um, because you do this also for work. Um, yeah, what we want to talk about today is an approach that is trauma informed. So it's an approach that you can use with former cult members or anybody who's been through any kind of trauma. Um, and when I started learning about mental health care and healthcare in general, because I work in a healthcare uh, setting, um, the first thing they teach us in all of our trainings in every company I've done is this approach. And I've noticed that unless you're taught it, it is not necessarily a natural thing that's there. Some parts of it might be, but there's a way that we can communicate with people who've been through trauma that is helpful in the moment. And, you know, you and I thought we were getting like, the communication tech. We thought we were so good at like, you know, communicating. And it's ironic because something I've had to practice so much is my crisis communication. Right. And that's a um, skill that comes with practice. But there are certain things that you do during a crisis that are effective and are not effective. And I've had so many trainings on this and it just makes sense and it works with the human brain. But um I think so many of us just want to help however we can and be the most effective. And a lot that's why a lot of people got into Scientology. They thought that they were learning like the real tech. So I thought today we could talk about maybe, you know, uh, some trauma stuff. What do you think? I'd say so. I mean, we've been chatting about this for months, so might as well uh, <laughs> record it and uh, share it with some other people because I'm sure it's going to help. And this has been something that I actually learned to help other people that I knew with other situations, mainly like not healthy relationships, because I think most of us probably know somebody or somebody's that either are or have been in, you know, an unhealthy, toxic, abusive relationship. So that's kind of why I wanted to learn about this was to know what the best language to use, how to best approach people, because you don't want it to feel like you're judging them. So that's always been something I try to keep in my mind too. For sure. Yeah. Um, I was really, really happy to hear that this position existed. I didn't know that this was a thing and it's called peer support specialist. So that's what I got certified in by the state of California. I had to go and take a proctored exam and um, fulfill training requirements and stuff. And I wanted to read off the core competencies that I learned so that you guys can understand where I'm coming from and what kind of work I'm doing every day at a crisis center. So um, the first one is the concepts of hope, recovery, and wellness. The second is the role of advocacy. The third is the role of consumers and family members in recovery. Psychiatric rehabilitation skills and service delivery and additional recovery principles, including practices defined by Medi-Cal State of California. Cultural and structural competence trainings. Man, are these so important, and I never got these <laughs> growing up, but cultural competency is everything. And we know that because if somebody can't speak Scientology, they can't really help us, and it's the same for every right. venture. Right. Uh, <laughs> Trauma-informed care, which is what we're gonna be talking about today. 
Um, it goes on with a lot of other things, group facilitation skills, self-awareness and self-care. I do a lot of groups at my workplace. Uh, yesterday we did an art therapy group. It was awesome. Uh, co-occurring disorders of mental health and substance abuse, conflict resolution, professional boundaries and ethics, safety and crisis planning, confidentiality, et cetera. So these are all the things that my job entails. But today we're going to talk about specifically trauma-informed care because it is just an awesome approach. And um, there is a, well, first I want to start actually with the definition of trauma because this is a little um, loaded. Not, yeah, it's not it's a loaded big potato. So this is a current definition from 2020 from mm -hmm. Kinder. And it says, what is trauma? Individual trauma results from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. Trauma has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, or spiritual well-being. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad because it is such a, like I said, it's such a loaded thing. It's just. Do you relate so, to that definition? I think it covers a lot, which is nice because for us, I think most of our trauma was pushed down and not acknowledged and like, you can't be a victim. So most of it, I think we all just kind of swallowed and pretend didn't happen. Like what about recent trauma though? Cause it says it's, it's experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life threatening. Cause I would say that a lot like, of these like, mind games that they play yeah. um, and yeah. going through disconnection. I was going to say, it's like that ongoing thing that it's kind of keeps popping up. emotionally harmful, right? Right. And, or you might feel your life is threatened. And you can have panic attacks. You can have all kinds of just like super intense depressive episodes, manic episodes. So yeah. I would, I would say, say that so. like what I've tried to, what I tried to remind myself was like, when I was going through those hard times, mm -hmm. I would tell myself, you're going through the trauma now. Mm -hmm. Like you're in an active trauma situation. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. So yeah, because I was really like not it's scary. Well, right. Yeah. And um right. when you're getting all these communications from your parents or the the organization or former auditors or counselors or whatever, I mean that's I was feeling life threatened and it could have not been real. It was um, like a paranoia from the fear that mm -hmm. they've created yep. within us for so long, but mm -hmm. I felt like my life was threatened. And so for me, that was a traumatic event, right? And then mm -hmm. our brain and our, our behaviors change yeah. as we go through trauma. So obviously yeah. trauma is so um, common. Some examples of trauma inducing events War, on, war or violence, childhood abuse or neglect, physical, emotional, verbal, or sexual abuse, intimate partner violence, accidents, disasters, grief and loss, medical interventions, witnessed violence, cultural or historical trauma, and intergenerational trauma. So, how? <laughs> I mean, it's so prevalent, right? So I don't know. I think yeah. the way we speak to people is um, so important and mm -hmm. that we talk in a trauma-informed way, right? So um, some of the things that I have been working on and practicing since I started and use daily is this empowerment model. Um, and as we know, power is a big dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I would say that having power over someone is completely unacceptable. And our approach is always to have power with. So instead of giving anybody orders or treating them like children, 
or um, infantilizing them, no matter what their medical condition is, we always want to talk to them uh, as though we're right by their side instead of telling them what to do, because that's not going to work if we're like barking orders anyway. And nobody really wants to do that. Right. Because so. that can make it worse, I would think. And I've seen people try to connect and do it in not a good way. And it backfires. So Yeah. 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 Uh, typically, it can even I've witnessed um, it actually enraging people uh, and slammed doors and you're trying to do a therapeutic group and then it's turning into something else and it's completely unhelpful um, and it's a finger pointing or whatever. And it's like, unless you can use a trauma informed approach and you're well practiced in it, sometimes things can go terribly wrong. Another point I wanted to mention is that the acknowledgements that we were taught growing up, I was like, always doing these, thought that it made me a great communicator, right? Two of them were specifically mentioned in a recent training that I did uh, while working with anybody who's in crisis um, or recently experienced trauma. And the two phrases that you don't say to them, I got that and I understand. And <laughs> your face. Um, <laughs> well, I've heard people say both of those and it can come across condescending probably, or like you're undervaluing their feelings and their experience. Exactly, right? So, so yeah. uh, sometimes we're dealing with people who just went through a sexual abuse or a uh, experience of losing their home and having to fight for themselves on the street and you saying, I understand, like you don't understand. Um, and even if you do, uh, there's actually a time and place for that. So unless you truly, truly, truly understand, like you've had that exact same experience, um, please come up with a different phrase to let them know that you've heard them. Um, and this entire model that we're about to talk about centers around listening. So in the middle, there's a ear and the ear is about listening. And this whole thing revolves around just being present and listening. You don't, I've noticed a lot of people become uncomfortable with people going through trauma because they're uncomfortable with emotions themselves. <laughs> yep that would be it and then they try to just be like it's okay it'll get better yeah but then but you and i cool. you and i have done so much of what we're doing right now because we're comfortable with the trauma because we understand that people ran from us when we were experiencing this and That's i don't want to run from anybody right right be an anchor and yeah then in their choppy how, sea. How can we most effectively help? Not like, oh, they're crying. I, I, what, mm -hmm. what can I say? What can I do? It's not about you. Yeah. It's yeah. about and how to help the person right in front right, of you, right? Right. And just being present is really probably one of the best things you, we can do, anybody can do to help listen, yeah. open, honestly, without judgment, which I think judgment is such a thing with us ex psychology people. Yeah. For sure. Don't, don't tell my husband I said that. <laughs> I won't. Don't let him watch this. Uh, but I know he's the guy in the chat just like who says, show us your tits sometimes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I told him he's going to get clawed alive if he does. Yeah, we got to keep it light. So we, because we're talking about such a heavy topic <laughs> right now. Right. Um, <laughs> so this is a, a method for dealing with people who have. Uh, experience trauma. So if you're noticing someone around you is going through something, the first step would be like ask permission. So, um, so hey, consent is important. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> like, Hey, Alicia, um, I see that you've been kind of alone today in, in your room and normally you're a bit social. Like, could I ask you about that a little bit? Um, before just going into something yeah. or assuming something or making a statement about yeah. something. Um, right. Or is it okay if we chat or is it fine if um, I just sit with you? Like there's 
many things, but you always want to start by asking permission and never assuming that anybody wants anything. And we're also not like, we're really trying to help people. There's no tech that we're trying to like push on them. There's no agenda. It's really how do we help and like what method will be the best for this person in this moment. Um, not everything works on everybody. And some people, if you can read the situation, you can de-escalate things from happening before they even happen. And I've been through violence prevention training. So like it is important to stop because what happens is as the aggression goes up sometimes and people are getting heated, they're going into that fight or flight, maybe they're fight in fight, um, their cognition is going down yeah. mm -hmm. offline, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So there's a whole method we learn, especially as the people who are trying to control this situation, we can't, we have to actually not listen to our instincts, which is hard. It's hard. Um, yeah. yeah, because our cognition is going down as they're going to a break mm -hmm. in their aggression. So it's like a really interesting um, parallel, but we yeah. do know certain things where you can stop things from happening before they even happen yeah. if you just follow some like basic tips instead mm -hmm. of provoking yeah. anything and there's people who like just are really upset because they've been through so much so like maybe it'll come out at you if you don't ask permission or if you just try to relate when that's actually inappropriate so like part of the wheel is relate with empathy um, but only done at appropriate times. So first thing I'm going to do is ask permission to speak. And then I'm going to go in probably with some open-ended questions. So those are questions that can't be answered with a yes or a no. So got it. Yeah. <laughs> so then like, they have to think about what they're saying to you and what they want you to know too. Yeah. And it keeps the conversation going. Yeah. So um me saying would you like to do this or this or um so it was like this or this they can say yes or no this or that if i say would you mind telling me about how you would have liked this to have gone then they have to think about and tell you which lets you know what they didn't get probably in that time too and what they would have liked too so yeah and it keeps the conversation going because i don't want them to be able to isolate even further if i've noticed that you're sitting there alone i'm not gonna say like are you happy are you sad yes no like no like maybe um would you tell me about like what your day was like today and then it can just keep yeah. the conversation going because it's not that they don't want to talk to you they kind of want an opening so framing questions that are about feelings, choices, and solutions is really important. And I've practiced it a lot. And everything on this wheel, we had to practice over and over again with different scenarios about problems that people come to you with um, and making sure that we hit all these points. So the next point. So if I said, uh, how are you feeling today? And you said, uh, or I said, tell me about your day and what, why are you feeling like this? And you said, um, well, I, I didn't, I'm new here. I didn't know the rules. And then this person got really upset with me because they wanted to go do this outdoor activity. Um, but I didn't know the rules and now I'm just like upset. Right. And, um, I actually like threw something because I was mad. And then now I'm like feeling like everybody hates me. And, um, you know, and then I could say, um, well, so the next part, I'm moving into the next part, validating strengths. So I could point out that it was really awesome that you didn't resort to physical violence. You threw your carrots and that's okay. It's a food fight. Um, you you controlled yourself so well in that moment and you took yourself to your room and uh showing that level of maturity is impressive um so you're validating those strengths right so maybe um they feel horrible about themselves in that moment 
but we're looking for what did they do right and how can we point that out to them, right? Yeah, that's powerful too because you're empowering <laughs> them, right? You're giving them exactly. that little bit of power so they can keep getting better, yeah. keep understanding their feelings and work yeah. through them because feelings what we are need. fluid and they come and they go. Yeah, yeah, moods are moods, right? And that's not a permanent thing. So we need that support in that moment. Um, Absolutely. I would probably ask another question, like, how would you like it to go? Like, what would you like to have happen? And then from there, let's imagine Alicia says, well, I kind of want to, I kind of want to um, have uh, this, I want to apologize because I feel bad because, you know, I didn't know the rules. I got really mad. And this, now this, this other person hates me and probably the staff hates me. So at this point, I'm really going to reflect and you can use reflect. You, you can do this out of order. You can use these at any stage that you feel appropriate, but it is kind of like, you kind of want to hit all the points, right? So I might've started with a reflection, but because we're talking about it, it'll come up now. So what I'll say is, um, I hear that you feel really bad because you know you threw that and you feel like that person hates you and that maybe everybody else does too and that you just didn't know the rules and so you're kind of like restating what they told you but in your own words to let them know that you heard it so it's not just an act it's not just an acknowledgement and that's validating too yeah Exactly. And that's how you let people know you really heard them. Um, I got that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Cool. Those aren't like, that doesn't show that you heard somebody, right? Yeah. That's, that's just a easy thing to say in the moment, but it doesn't yeah. help empower or let the other person know what you heard or what you understood. Yeah, exactly. So at this point, I would actually bring in relate with empathy. So I would think, you know, we've we've we have a little bit of rapport. They've told me what's going on. And relate with empathy is is tricky because it's not this whole thing is not about you. You're using this tool to relate in that moment so that possibly they might want to do the next step, which is partner on a plan. And you've got to be mindful that if you turn it into you like a story about you at this point, they're going to shut down. And I've personally done that so many times when people do that to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah definitely. It's, it's, a, a it's unfortunate. Yeah, it's a very yeah. common thing, I think. And I don't think people mean to do it. I feel like I've had that happen, especially with older generations of people. And I understand they're trying to be present in the way that they know how. Mm -hmm. but it is very unhelpful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes you don't need a story yeah. Yeah. about them because you're finally opening up yeah. and then they're like, well, yeah. but this don't one minimize. time I walked by the church of Scientology and then they like mailed me forever. And you're like, thanks for okay. that story. Yeah, Thanks. you just shut down, right? So yeah. this, at this point, relating with empathy for me would be, I've lost my temper before too. And one time I got really upset at my friend and I really was embarrassed afterwards. So like really badly. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I would like to work with you on like sharing some tips on how I got through it. And then maybe you could give me some ideas about what's worked for you in the past and like how you've gotten through it. And we could partner on a plan. And that's good because you're empowering them and you're inviting them to learn from them also. Because any and every situation is a place that we can learn, whether it's a positive experience or a not great one, but we can still learn from it. Have what, how to do better, what maybe what not yeah. to do, maybe how to tweak something so yeah. we can better connect with somebody who needs us yeah. because 
we were those kids, we were those teens, we were those young adults that needed somebody, right? When we yeah. were overwhelmed with our feelings and we didn't know how to express that because we were not allowed to. So express- I mean, it's, it's, it's still, still happens here. today. I'm not gonna lie. Like I'll try to communicate an anxiety yeah. or something you or I are going through. And then I get like a 20 minute story that has nothing to do with what's happening and it's yeah. kind of hard because then it triggers like every Your time we were not listened to before yeah. Yeah. yeah all those times that yeah exactly so it is hard and people mean well and we yeah understand this but yeah. it is frustrating yeah it's not um, ill-intended it's just that one sentence i said or two sentences about like this has happened to me it really affected me that's enough that's, an, yeah. that's enough yeah. you don't need to go into detail you don't need to even say the person's name you don't need to say what the weather was like that day and what the i mean it's completely a waste of time to somebody who's experienced trauma and yeah. you're pushing them farther away so well and if they're an active trauma too active yeah, exactly. we have to bring them into the present not worry about our yeah. past right then yeah to me because it's like yeah. they're actively in this and that's um, that includes i mean that's a little bit of a different like communication during a crisis too mm -hmm. is very different you use short terms yeah. so i did a class this past week about evading mm -hmm. somebody who's gotten aggressive people mm -hmm. i work with have had uh homicidal ideation mm -hmm. all types of things we need to be aware of this we need to always be aware of how to defuse situations and we never um, excuse me, we never uh, are going to physically engage. It's It doesn't make sense. So we're right. always taught how to, because we're the people's caregivers in that moment. Yeah, you're just, We can't yeah. have somebody think that they're just trying to challenge us. Like, no, this is a professional setting. So for us, de-escalation is super important. And there's a technique that, they, that we were taught recently where if somebody's starting to escalate, you literally use their name over and over again because their brain is offline. So if somebody, or they're going into a traumatic, you know, just zone where they're Man, going they're away from you. Of, yeah. So calling their name would bring them back into the here and the now, right? I don't want to say into the present time. It's more because... like short term. It's more short and it's, they can hear those words. If you're, okay. if you're doing a sentence where you're like, Hey, what's going on? Is this, happening to you right now and i swear blah 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 blah, blah. no what we do not like, register so let's that, right? say somebody's like um really melting down mm -hmm. hey alicia alicia hey look at me we don't do that here alicia alicia let's go outside okay look at me alicia let's go outside come on let's do it and you're in control of the situation it's not like you're asking questions right. they're not thinking right now yeah. You can give two options. Would you like to do this or would you like to do that? And it can help with effective coping me mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Would you like to go for a walk or do you want to get a drink of water? Do you want to cool down, talk about this in five minutes, or do you want to go to your room? And you're giving them very clear things they can choose from because the mm -hmm. brain's offline. That's right. it. Yeah. No more yeah. options, right? They don't need a zillion no. options because it's no. going to be overwhelming. And yeah, not they're be already helpful. overwhelmed. They're angry. If you give them too many options, guess what? You just got punched in the face. <laughs> so it's a very not what you like, want. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, this is stuff we can really use every day. Like yeah. this is not just yeah. in a crisis setting. This no. is like when you're dealing with people who have been overwhelmed and mm -hmm. they're um, completely trying to get their lives back together, whether it's domestic violence or a yeah. abusive relationships or a loss. Yeah. This could be really helpful. Um, Black Friday when people go nuts at Walmart or Target or whatever store. I'm sorry, but that's what I thought of. Because hey, I know are, how to block. Like, people are wild. <laughs> you know, I have, safe, I have safe so stances. We can, everybody, we can practice. Everybody yeah. can use something from here because uh, you want to fight over that 50 screen, 50 inch TV screen on some promo. It's not really worth it. It's not no. really worth it. You no, know, exactly. Better choices. Let's do better choices. Like that's what I think of only because if you ever worked retail during that Black Friday, 
you probably have lost faith in humanity like I have. <laughs> um, well, if we have trauma-informed care perspectives, yeah. we can meet the needs of survivors who have experienced mm -hmm. trauma in their life um, by following those principles. Uh, another thing that we can do is we can encourage resilience in the survivors. So they've already been through it. And at this point, how are we encouraging resilience and how are we highlighting their strengths and how are we helping versus uh, judgment and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff? That's We're, important too, because when yeah. people feel validated and they don't feel like they're just horrible. I mean, cause how many of us yeah. feel like I messed up on this thing. So therefore I must be just a horrible, like, no, one little moment doesn't define who you are, you know? Yeah. And we and can I, always recover from that. And I liken, like, I don't have the exact photo, but you know, those old photos, cause they show us to this in training, um, where like, like usually it's like a rabbit head and like you see a rabbit head in front of you, but then like you turn it and then you see like something else. It's like a woman yeah. or something like, like that. The black and white ones. Yeah. Like it's just in black and white. And they're like, what do you see when you look at this? And it's just random. And some people are like, I see a butterfly. Some people are like, I see a cat or a dog. Well, or... those are, those are different. Those are ink pots. Okay. Oh, okay. That's what I thought you were talking <laughs> but about. But this is more like um, a picture where like, you know, if you hold it to the side, you see a rabbit head, but then you turn it up and then you see a woman and it's more like a different approach. So what I picture okay. is like uh, everybody right now, before having a trauma informed approach, they're seeing a rabbit. But then when they can learn just these really like small things, <laughs> really, that make such a big difference. They can see the real picture of like the woman and um the complete whole thing and they're just looking at it from a different viewpoint so when we can i have a, a friend who does security and and not because he's ill will the nicest human being in my life but thought that the uh the people who would walk by who he would have to deal with and who would cause problems sometimes he thought that when they were hearing voices that they were kind of, he was like, you know, I think it's fake. I think um, they're, I think they're messing with me. Yeah, and then like that. over time, we've had so many talks about trauma informed care yeah. and he's let me know. Thank you for telling me that like, they're actually hearing things and yeah. that they're actually being commanded. Like mm -hmm. I have, you know, people who have mentioned to me, like the voices are getting so loud. They're telling yeah. me to leave and go walk into the street. That's scary. And so since having that just little bit of knowledge that like, okay, this is real, they're really suffering. Um, he's been able to like deal with them so much better in, in a way that like is actually helpful. And we talk about these kinds of tips and I'll be like, ask their name, you know, cause if you can say their name um, and ask them a question, sometimes people who are having vis visual or audio hallucinations mm -hmm. can um, come to you and the voices get quieter. So like, it's just brain malfunctioning. It's an illness. So like if we can have compassion and look at it like a disease, like it is, it's yeah. not, it's like literally your brain is like, imagine you're hearing yeah. things all right. the time. And it's yeah. people, you know, and love possibly telling mm -hmm. you to do things. It gets really confusing. Yeah. So if we can all have this, um, just like slight bit of empathy and it's not that people are mean, it's that they just didn't understand. Nobody ever taught us this. Nobody taught me this mm -hmm. until they did, right? Until you took the power and yeah. went to college and educated yourself. I just felt like there had to be a better way because otherwise- Clearly there is. is. Yeah. There's no healing yeah. and there's no right. recovery. And there's, yeah, and how do you help other people even if you can barely skate through and barely yeah. get yourself kind of sort of in some life, right? Because how do you totally. then- help others because what did you go through all that for not that you went through it for other people but since you went through it can you and do you want to help other people um that's always been important to me 100 percent. so i kind of wanted to just end up with some helpful recovery language yes we were talking about this right yeah this is really really important and you were telling me there's a bunch of examples which was really helpful for me to hear um, this was something that even though I didn't realize it when it was happening, uh, 
I had a family member who is now passed, but she would always talk. She was a mediator by, that was her career. So she was very good at trying to find balance and trying to be, you know, just yeah. have everybody get along. And yeah. I did not get along with my parents very, very clearly. So when she would come to visit, she would always try to mediate and I'd be like, there's no help in them. Like they are set on this one thing, their religion. And I don't agree with it. And she would always yeah. come in with the sweetest words. And uh, after talking to you, it really hit me that like, she was just really trying to hear me and listen to me and that let me be uh, validated and heard. And she couldn't say what she really felt because I was still, you know, a teenager. And after I was an adult, she'd be like, yeah, I don't like that stuff either. But, you know, it was nice that she was respectful enough of me as a young teenager and a kid to come yeah. to make sure I was safe and to not still talk about something that could be re-traumatizing to bring up when it's actively, when I, when you're living it, so to speak. And that's really powerful too, because yeah. um, I think those were some of my best memories and best um, helpful people in my life that really like showed me there is other ways to live. And, yeah. um, you know, there's much better things out there than what I'm currently going through or living through or whatever. So that was very helpful. And I think that you're going to tell us some really amazing stuff. <laughs> I, I, we've talked about just that the people who we get along with best in our life now and who we like to work with, talk to, do everything with, the reason why is because they're kind of coming from this approach. And we didn't even realize that. But um, that's the truth. And it's really that important to us because it has to do with judgment. So I want to talk about some commonly used words and then a reframe for what might actually be going on with the person. So something that's said with judgment would be um, she's being resistant. Judgment aware, she's uncomfortable with. I like that. <laughs> like that. because you're not blaming her you're acknowledging the why her action yeah. is what it is which is really yeah. important um another one she's emotional the next the we next hear one that a lot. we hear that one a lot next, yeah the next one she's having a challenging day that would be mm -hmm. a reframe right mm -hmm. so like sometimes oh there's some slack right yeah. right that's a label. That's a judgment. I was just going to say, and it's, yeah. And it's not usually said as like a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. What was it they used to diagnose women with back in the... Was it hysteria? Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's reminiscent of that. Um, the next one is snippy. So then uh, something that would be judgment aware would be like, might be hungry. Um, maybe is triggered by something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Next one, like, he's pessimistic. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say, like, he lacks options. Yeah. And that way you give him options and you're going to get better outcomes. If you can, yeah. Yeah, right, if you can. Yeah, I mean, sometimes people don't have just, uh, yeah. qualifications for certain government programs. And you're, you're right. labeling them as pessimistic. And they've tried everything that they can. Yeah. And maybe and they're, they're just, just out of options. Yeah, yeah. And they're desperate and frustrated. I mean, you know. Yeah. Um, and that goes to, you know, when people tell you to see the glass half full, like, yeah. just listen, like, yeah. stop the judgment, stop the cliches, mm -hmm. just listen. Are they out of options? Because <laughs> it's yeah. hard to see the glass full, half full when yeah. you're out of options. What know? if they don't even have a glass to start with? They can't be half full, they don't have one. It's not up at the same level playing field. They're not um, eating and they're currently in the rain. So how are you going to uh, pass that judgment? You know, um, another one is uh, egotistical. I actually reframe that as like, he might have a lack of self-esteem. Because that's you're trying to over really the underlying need. Um, and sometimes people are trying to convince you of their, mm -hmm. their worth because um, they have a need to be filled there. Yeah. Um, he's complicated. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So a judgment aware version would be, he is misunderstood or he's very complex. I like complex. That's good. Yeah. So these are just like, you know, we can play with them because they're reframes and it allows you to actually be there for the person instead of just writing it off. And then it comes to be like, they feel like the judgment could also be the power thing. Like I'm above you or I'm smarter than you or I have more or yeah. no more or am more. Yeah. Whatever. Power with instead of power over. Yeah. So yeah. We're always trying to empower. So, um, absolutely. The, there's demanding. So like, Alicia, you're so demanding. <laughs> and instead, maybe we understand that they have a lack of power in many areas in their life. Mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> I feel like most people, I, I know many people that have had that issue, like at work with certain people, you know, dynamics at work are so different. Mm -hmm. I have had multiple friends mm -hmm. that have had a coworker that thought they were the boss of everybody, even though they're all in the same thing. And you're like, why are you telling me what to do when we're both at the same level playing field? But again, maybe at home, they don't get to do that. Maybe at home, they have to be super submissive or quiet or, they're yeah. just, you know, and so they're flexing where they think they can in some weird way and uh, trying to compensate in other areas because yeah. work is work and, you know, they can get a different job if they Total. need to or yeah. whatever. So yeah. I've, I've had so many friends that have had issues with that specific thing that I've heard stories. Yeah. And I'm just like, what is this? Yeah. But it makes sense. People want to <laughs> be taken maybe up, at you know? Maybe at home there is a different power dynamic. That's what I'm that, thinking. Yeah. That's what, I, I mean, I don't know the people personally, so I can't say, but that's what my guess would be is just that yeah. they don't have anywhere else to do that or they don't have any other friends maybe that that works with. Yeah. And then the last one, um, I mean, this would be like, um, let's say uh, maybe you're trying to help somebody uh, and they say, uh, well, they're just being finicky. Mm -hmm. Like maybe like you're, a nurse is trying to assist a patient and um, they're being finicky. Um, I would actually say more like they've had probably they've probably had an abusive past. Um, they might not like physical touch. I would say they could just be scared if it's like a needle or something like that. Yeah. Everyone has their own thing. Yeah. That, There's yeah. always so many, so with. many um, things, right? There's some yeah. some people who we deal with who don't. Uh, they, there's gen, they're gender specific because of the trauma they've been through, mm -hmm. um, right? Like some some people don't do well with males. Some people don't do well with females. Mm -hmm. We try to be mindful of that and. We always want to approach people who have been through trauma or are going through active trauma mm -hmm. with this understanding and this um, framework and approach so that yeah. we're never causing harm. Um, yeah. And like I said, I've witnessed a lot of harm too by this being not implemented. So I'm just like so happy we've kind of been able to talk about. And this is just scratching the surface. I mean, I, there's courses I've done that are weeks long on this topic. And there are degrees that I have pursued <laughs> because of this general core principle of really being there for someone. And like you and I value people who are real, right? Mm -hmm. And we Absolutely. like cannot, it like makes us physically ill to like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> be around like there's no reason. Yeah. I, I feel like I want to say there's no reason, although we don't know. Somebody else may have a reason. It's just triggering for us because we've had to give up so much to be authentic and honest. And so we know it's possible, even though it's not always the most exciting outcome in some ways. Yeah. Being free and having your own freedom, you can't really, you can't top that. You can't beat that, right? It's just... Yeah it's the best thing that you can be and yeah. people having power over themselves and their thoughts and their actions and their lives is sounds like the most basic human need and, and really outcome for people. But some of us and many of us in one way or another really have to fight or really try hard to get that. So, yeah. you know, it is yeah. important. Um. It's incredibly important. And uh, there's so many incredible things that we can do to empower people on their journey. Mm -hmm. And to me, the reco recovery means 
like helping and assisting that person to, or when they've gotten to the point of rekindling their own hopes, dreams, and aspirations, right? So there are bridges to recovery and that's what we assist on. And there are techniques that are science-based and not just written by a crazy science, science fiction writer, but actually uh, science-based and they work really, really well. And it's how people recover and it's how we have success stories. And then it's how people come into the peer specialist role because they've had their own su successes and they want to work with others to help. So it's like pretty powerful stuff. And, um, anything we can do to help um people who have had other agendas pushed on them like i just want to rekindle what's like your dream and <laughs> what was your agenda yeah. yeah because it doesn't matter what any of our agendas are it doesn't matter if i want you to go to college i want you to do this i want you to go to do that it doesn't matter and it doesn't like what do you want help. yeah <laughs> what makes you happy and what makes you yeah. proud and this was a really cool course that when you took, was this the same course that you were kind of nervous for when we were like texting back and forth? And I was like, hey, I'm holding your hand from over here. Is It's that one, it right? Was, um, it was the, when I was taking the state exam. That was, that was nerve wracking. So okay. Nerve -wracking. okay. Yeah, because it was proctored and it's a really, it was, you know, I have another state license and it was similar and mm -hmm. it's always scary to get like a state certification and, um, and they expect a lot, like they really have high, um, your interpersonal skills, your, your mm -hmm. ethics, like the, your knowledge of specific field, specific things is really important. And you and I did not grow up with this. This is all new. Like, no. yeah, you know, <laughs> but it is so interesting. So for everybody listening, she would send me pictures of the book like when she would highlight and she's like, Hey, what is this like read like to you with our background? And I would sit there at work getting those messages and like at home and I'd be like, let me read that again. Let me read that again. Let me read that again. Because sometimes it takes multiple times of reading it and letting that absorb into your brain to undo yeah. what was ingrained in us. And it was so powerful. And I was like, this is really amazing. This yeah. is really important important and so we're so happy to do this little chit chat here just kind of yeah. going over some of this stuff because it is in depth but once you get the basics yeah you can you kind of know like you probably know better than I do of what to do and how to do it and when to do it because you're so trained in it but even hearing some of this stuff is very helpful for me or anybody because well it helps me process it, it as well you know yeah and it does bridge yeah. um but it also like if we can start having chats about these mm -hmm. basic things, then we can get into more in-depth conversations mm -hmm. because once we all understand what trauma informed care is, then it's so easy to see when it's uh, some things are not being implemented or talk about other things that are helpful or whatever, but we have this basic mm -hmm. understanding, right? Um, the foundation is there. Yeah. And there's also the, the um, group that I took, this training through, um, mm -hmm. they offer, they're called RI International. If anybody wants to get certified in peer support, they offer um, all types of classes. And the one I took was a two week intense class and it um, was awesome. And I really, if anybody wants to be like effective <laughs> in, in helping uh, former members of Scientology or anything at all. Yeah. I highly recommend it. I wish it would have been included in like a high school class or something for everybody. Yeah. But um, I'm going to put tons of links and resources in hmm. the um, bottom here when we're done and when we upload it so that people can find these trainings. Um, and then I can't wait to talk about some of the other things because, you know, everything I'm always sending Alicia, like all these highlighted things. Mm -hmm. um, and some things, you know, I'm trying to not stay isolated either. I've been isolated my whole life. And when I learn something and I learn different words, mm -hmm. it makes me feel like I can't communicate too with you right. or others because 
certain concepts aren't there. So by us doing this, it's really helpful not only to share the information for others, mm -hmm. but then we can be on the same page when we're talking about um, helping people and discussing um, people who write to us or, you know, things like that. Yeah, so it'll absolutely. be really fun to continue yeah. these um, mm -hmm. mental health talks and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Every little bit of information about this is really needed. And I love that there's a place for us to do this. I mean, because we were just texting and sending messages and pictures. And that's how yeah. we talk, just like sporadic random stuff because um, our brains are everywhere. But it's nice to be able to sit down and talk and share this with people because I know how helpful it was. And I know the people that we've talked to, how much it's helped different people in different ways. And it's really needed. So we hope that yeah. everybody gets a little something from this little chat, this little information. Yeah, I um, received a message today that literally made me cry. And it's kind of been making me cry all morning. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to share a little part of it because this is this training in use. And for a long time, I did not know why I was doing this. I just knew that like I wanted to be prepared for if anybody needed my help. And they have needed my help <laughs> quite a bit. And um, this- Surprise. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is from somebody who will remain anonymous, but we've been communicating with and been through some heavy stuff with lately and been standing by their side. And um, so they said, made a new friend in Vanessa. She's real and understands me. And it's hard to find someone who knows what you've been through and what has happened. Finally, someone who can help speak for me and understand when others cannot. She understands and her laugh <laughs> and hug opens up the hell that you're going through. She's kind and tells jokes that brighten the day. And there's other things and I'm leaving out identifying information, but yeah. just to hear that. And this is someone who watched our YouTube channel, you guys, and who reached out to us. And um, we're so honored that you're listening and you're here and you're uh, letting us know what is happening with you, what yeah. your needs are, what is working for you and what isn't and how can we support you because it's been just an honor to be able to help people through the hell that we've been through absolutely absolutely and we do try to uh, email back and respond back when people message us so if you guys have questions or whatever feel free yeah and I'd probably be able to provide links to resources. And obviously, if anybody else is, or if anybody is going through any kind of mental health crisis, there's mm -hmm. emergency numbers as well as warm lines where you can call and talk. And you don't have to be in active crisis. If you just want to talk to somebody, you can call. So there's plenty of resources out there. Please utilize them um, and find a peer because a peer is a very specific thing. It's someone who has been through something similar. So whether it's um, from your specific cult or your specific um, high school or your specific abuser, sometimes having people who have been through something similar and yeah. if it's possible, um, it really, really, really helps to have support. Absolutely. So thanks for hanging with us, guys. Yay. We are sending our whole hearts out to you. And let us know what you think in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe. We're still working on our monetization. We're almost there, actually. So we're very close. Keep leaving those videos on for us. And we really appreciate you guys being here. Thanks for hanging with us. Bye, guys. Deuces. Bye. You girls watch out for those DBs. We are the DBs, mister.